uh, here at Crossway, we like to preach through a book, and we're preaching through the book of Judges. And in our small group, Digging Deeper, that started up on Wednesday, one of them asked, well, what exactly are the Judges? And I think that's a great question. I never really answered it. So I'm going to answer it today. When most of us think of the word judge, what do we think of? We think of this guy. I didn't have a photo there, but we think of the gavel. We think of the person who sits in a courtroom. We think of the person who um, pronounces guilty or, or not guilty and maybe a sentencing. That's what we think of judge because that's our modern day terms. But when you think of it in the Old Testament, um, we, we really don't have necessarily a mindset sometimes of, of what to think about. We don't have a category to put it in. Usually when we think of Old Testament figures, there's like four different categories that we think of. We think of the priests. When we studied the book of Exodus and we looked at the tabernacle, we learned about the priests and their work there. Um, and they're the Levites there. We think of kings, maybe King David, King Solomon, uh, King Saul, some of the ones, the monarchy. But that's really after the time of Judges. Um, Judges falls kind of in between uh, when Moses and Joshua, who were the spiritual leaders, Moses led them out of uh, uh, Egypt and into the edge of the promised land, and then Joshua led them in, or the prophets who come later too in the time of the kings who are given a word from the Lord and called people to repentance. And the judges really don't fit in any of them because they're in a different time period. And so to understand kind of the the judges, the best way to describe them, and I got this from um, Tim Mackey of the Bible Project, is as regional tribal chieftains. And when we looked at Judges 1 and 2, we, we saw that there was this settling of the land. Joshua had created a victory. They had taken over it. But God was really clear that he wanted them to settle it at a certain time period, slowly but surely, so the land wouldn't go to waste and displace the people there. And so as that happened, the nation stopped functioning kind of in this grand kind of national way under a, a spiritual leader there, but rather in tribal ways. Remember, Israel itself is descendants of Jacob, and the tribes are names of his 11 sons and the, uh, uh, then the two sons of Joseph. Um, and so it now functions in much more of that tribal way where those tribes or those groups function almost autonomously. They work together. We saw that in that. And so the judges are these regional tribal chieftains. Some of them have um, great spiritual leadership. Othniel, we saw, was actually a guy that we should model ourselves after, but what we're going to actually see in the book of Judges is that they're not even close to being prophets, and they're not close to being Moses or Joshua. There's actually going to be this decline until, honestly, the judges themselves almost look as bad as the people they're delivering from, and so I don't really want to call them spiritual leaders, but rather they're kind of this regional tribal chieftains, and they serve a purpose. They serve a role, and that is to to bring Israel redemption and Um, hope from uh, being under the uh, foreign occupation. And so today we're going to read through two judges, but we're going to focus on one because one judge has one verse. Um, And so we're going to look at Ehud and Shamgar. Um, But if you want to turn with me in your Bibles, we'll be looking at Judges 3, verses 12 through 31. You can follow along if you want to see the sermon notes. They should be have handed to you in the bulletin there. Also, we have everything online through the YouVersion app. You can pick up the text that we're going to look at as well as the notes there. But this is the word of the Lord, Judges 3, verses 12 through 13, 31, and it says this. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Because they did this evil, the Lord gave Elgon, king of Moab, power over Israel. Getting the Ammonites and the Amalekites to join him... Elgon came and attacked Israel, and they took possession of the city of Palms. Now, the city of Palms is another name for the city of Jericho. The Israelites were subject to Elgon, king of Moab, for 18 years. Again, the Israelites cried out to the Lord, and he gave them a deliverer, Ehud, a left-handed man, the son of Gera, the Benjamite. The Israelites sent him with a tribute to Elgon, king of Moab. Now, Ahab had made a double-edged sword about a cubic long, which is about between 12 inches and 18 inches, depending on what your notes are, but I think it's closer to 12, about the size of a forearm, um, which he strapped to the right under his clothing. He presented the tribute to Elgon, king of Moab, who was a very fat man. And after Ehud had presented the tribute, he sent on their way those who had carried it. But on reaching the stone images near Gilgal, he himself went back to Elgon and said, Your Majesty, I have a secret message for you. The king said to his attendants, Leave us, and they all left. He had then approached him while he was sitting alone in the upper room of his palace and said, I have a message from God for you. And as the king rose from his seat, he had reached with his left hand, drew the sword in his right, from his right thigh and plunged it into the king's belly. And even the handle sank in after the blade and his bowels discharged. 
And Ehud did not pull the sword out, and the fat closed in over us. Then Ehud went out to the porch. He shut the doors of the upper room behind them and locked them. And after he had gone, the servants came and found the doors of the upper room locked. They said, he must be relieving himself in the inner room of the palace. They waited to the point of embarrassment, but when he did not open the doors of the room, they took a key, unlocked them, and they saw their Lord fallen to the floor dead. While they waited, Ehud got away. He passed by the stone images and escaped to Surah. When he arrived there, he blew a trumpet in the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites went down with him from the hills and with him leading them. Follow me, he ordered them, for the Lord has given Moab, your army, into your hands. So they followed him down, and the Lord took possessions of the fords of the Jordan that led to Moab. They allowed no one to cross over. All the time they struck down about 10,000 Moabites, all vigorous and strong, not one escaped. That day Moab was made subject to Israel, and the land had peace for 80 years. After Ehud came Shamgar, son of Anath, the struck, who struck down 600 Philistines with an ox god, he too saved Israel. Well, it's going to become a pretty familiar cycle as we go through the Judges. We were told in Judges 2 that this is the way things are going to be. He outlined kind of the spiritual pathway that we're going to see the rest of the book. It starts, as, this story starts like every story of the Judges, of the 12 Judges that we're going to look at. We're now in 2 and 3. It starts with Israel's failure. As we said, uh, and as was hinted at, even though Israel promised, when they got to, the, to the, the promised land, the land that is modern day Israel, that they would follow God's commandments and do everything God had called them to, as soon as Joshua died, start, things started to go downhill. In one generation, people started to fade away and not follow the Lord anymore. And there's this cycle of them failing and coming under um, occupation of foreigners, and we see that here. Israel failed. They did evil in the eyes of the Lord. We see that in Judges 3, 12. Uh, it says, again, they did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Because they did evil, God gave them over to Elgon, or Eglon. And so we see that, right? God gave them into the hands of Eglon, the king of Moab. We see that, that God he gave them the consequences for the sins, that he empowered uh, and allowed Elgon to take over this. And, and it takes 18 years of suffering before they cry out. Now, we'd love to say that they cried out in repentance, that they were sorry for what they did, but the text is actually, the way that it describes it is, they're just in pain. They don't like the consequences of what's happening to them, and so they cried out in pain. And this is the situation that we find ourselves in here today. Now, again, the story of Judges, in some ways, is frustrating because it seems like it's the same pattern over and over again. It's so predictable and, and we can see it, yet the thing that should amaze us the most is not the fact that the Israelites continue to fall into sin, but even though that they don't deserve it, God brings them a redeemer. Now last week I told you, and a lot of you reminded me, that, I, that this story that we we're going to read reminded me of Jabba the Hutt. Okay, now I know not all of us are Star Wars fans, but this is Jabba the Hutt, Okay. There's a reason why I said that yesterday. One, if you look at him, he was described as a very fat man. That's repeated over and over. His fat plays a bigger role in here than we would care to admit. But also, Elgon actually means round cow. Like that's what his, or Eglon means round cow. That's what his name would mean. So there's a satire here. I, I hope as you read it that this story, you kind of looked at it and go, this is crazy and over the top because the writer of Judges very much creates a story with humor. He creates it with satire and with these caricatures. And the caricature that he has is literally of Eglon, this uh, big, huge kind of um, not-so-smart guy, and Ehud, who is this cunning Israelite. So, what we see is that Ehud devises a plan to kill the king when he paid their tribute. The Israelites were under um, Eglon's domain, and every year they would have to bring some of their, probably their agricultural stuff and their food as a tribute. It means that it was like a tax that they had to bring. And so Ehud was a part of the procession, who would bring, the, the group that would bring it to the king. And so that's the story. 
Ehud understands that he had the opportunity to come and, and meet the king, and that he would, so he devised a plan, that he would smuggle in the short double-edged sword. Now, uh, that's smart. What we hear is the whole plan in, in the very beginning, how Ehud did this, that he, he created a double-edged sword, a, a quick weapon, he could do what he needed to do, and he would smuggle it in, and it says that he was left-handed. And, and now, this is important, okay? Now, there's some debate about this, about whether it, it, what the left-handed means and the significance of it. The, the fact of the matter is, is it's the way that he snuck it past the guards. In, in the Old Testament, if you were right-handed was a sign of kind of blessing. There's everything about the right-handedness that's important. And so to be left-handed was thought kind of even worse connotations than it is today. And so... Um, there's some debate about whether he was actually crippled that his right hand wouldn't work or if he was an elite soldier. Depending on who you read, um, there's different variations of this because it left-handed literally means impended on his right side. Now, what do you do when you kind of come to these kind of things? One, you figure out what's the main point. The main point isn't whether he, his right hand doesn't work or he's an elite soldier. Rather, the, the tells us this so that the it in. It's the details. So they see, if this was a movie, they would see the guards frisking him, and they wouldn't even think to frisk this side. They would just check out the, the, the or I'm going the opposite way because I'm right-handed, right? Um, but they would frisk the, the, the other side because they would expect that that's where the weapon would be. And so you would see that he creates this dagger. You would see him getting past the guards, and you would know that he might be able to accomplish his, his goal. That's the reason why he tells it to. But I, I personally land that he's a actually a mercenary. He's a well-trained soldier. Um, and, and I did a switch here. And the reason is, is because I read the best people and I had it with an open Bible. Whenever we come to these things where people disagree, that's the way we come at it. Read the best people, their opinions, open up your Bible and try and figure out what's right. And if you look at it, if you would use a concordance or you'd use a thing called Strong's Number that kind of can track words or, or that, you'd find that that word left-handed is used in Judges 20, verse 16. And it says, among all these soldiers who are ironically were also from Benjamin, which means on the right-handed side, there's some irony there that you should see, there are 700 select troops who are left-handed, that exact same word, each of whom could sling a stone at a hair and not miss it. And so... Some people will preach this text that he was so, you know, the king took him for granted because his right hand wasn't functioning the way that it should. But I think actually what this is is just a story to tell us how he snuck it in and that he was actually this cunning and um, pretty uh, strong kind of mercenary type who, who was that. They think that that phrase is used because the Benjamites would kind of make themselves not be able to use their right hand to teach them to be ambidextrous. And so this is how Ehud devised his plan and was able to pull it off. And so what we see is that Ehud crafts this plan of how he can kill the king, and he accomplishes it. He, he, he literally goes and pays the tributes, he walks away, and the story, the narrator of Judges tells us that he comes to these stones. Now, depending on what your text is, some of them refers to them to idols. And he dismisses everyone else, and then he comes to these idols, foreign gods, not any statues that the Lord would have, and he quick rushes back to Eglon and says, I have a message for you. Now, Eglon uh, probably saw all of this, he, he, or he at least heard that this was it, and, and so he assumed that, that maybe Ehud had a special message of the Lord. Now, he even uses this once he gets the, the people away. But Elgon didn't necessarily, Eglon didn't necessarily understand what was going on, so he dismisses his guards, he dismisses everyone so he can get the secret message. And it's exactly in that moment when they leave that Ehud slices open Eglon's bowels and sneaks out and locks the doors. Now, I, I mean, you can't make this stuff up. It's like junior high humor, and it's here in the Bible. Um, but it literally says that he slices open his bowels, depending on what your translation is. The, the NIV says it kindly. It says that his bowels were discharged, um, but basically cut him in his abdomen right in the area where his intestine and all that would be, and the fat overcome the sword, and it smelled bad. I mean, what does it say that the, that the, the guards assume? 
they smell this disgusting order and assume he's going to the bathroom. Now, obviously, he had this set up in his room where he could go to the restroom there, and so they just assumed that he was going to the restroom. Now, this gave Ehud the perfect cover. He could sneak out, lock the door, and get himself some time to kind of um, get out of there. Uh, And so we see that, that the guards smell this, and they're waiting there, and it's getting embarrassing now. They wait probably a few minutes, and they still smell the odor. They, they wonder, what is, what's going on in there? But then finally, it's to the spot where this doesn't seem normal, and they get a key, and they unlock it. And what they find is that Eglon is dead when they finally unlock the door. Now, Ehud is long gone, and he goes and blows a trumpet. So obviously, there's a plan here. He did, didn't do this randomly. He had hatched a plan, he was cunning, of a way to devise the sword, a sword small enough that the guards probably wouldn't notice it, it could be concealed enough, that he would do it on the side that he didn't expect, the right side, because they would expect to be left, because most people are are soldiers are are left-handed, or right-handed, and so they'd have it on their left. And he got it past there, used the ploy of having a secret message from a god or goddess that he could tell the king, and he knew that the king would want to know that, and then He gets rid of all the guards and he kills them. And then in that moment where his plan is achieved, he blows the trumpet and he calls all the Israelites to come to the area where the Moabite armies would flee and they took over all the main kind of highways and they slaughter all the Moabites and they are free. And what we see is that he rallies the, the Israelites and defeat the strong Moabites. And it's interesting. The writer of, of Judges plays Eglon as kind of a fool, you know? But he says that all of these armies are actually really strong. They're strong and vigorous, and there's 10,000 of them. He, he wants to see that this wasn't just cunning, but that there's a, a big strength there that Israel had to overcome. And what we see is the result is that Israel has peace for 80 years, which is even longer than Othniel. Now, I don't know about you. I mean, when I read a story, when I read this story and I I read the -the over-the-top details, you kind of go, how is this going to apply to me? I I mean, I don't walk around with a dagger. I I don't, uh, you know, I don't plan on cutting somebody open to where he smells terrible And I'm going to use that as a plan and a ploy to try and take care of, create a cover for me. But here at Crossway, we we take it seriously that in 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, where it says that all scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So the servant of God may thoroughly equip for every good work. So how does a story like this have to do with us? Well, As I said it before, Israel's cycle of idolatry should remind us of our own wayward hearts. This week, um, I'm part of a group, um, an email chain, or I don't know, message board, it's it's way back, but I get it through email, of a group of people, they they engage on different topics. And one, an acquaintance of mine who's a church planner in Tucson, had in that title, if you got everything you wanted, what would you have? And he told a story, he's a bivocational pastor, and he's, uh, he write, writes for a newspaper, and so he was tasked with writing an article on a real estate agent. And um, he, he was going through the normal interview, asking about, you know, who are the influential people, and the interview kind of went the way that it should, and as it was ri- wrapping up, he just asked the question, if you got everything you wanted, what would you have? Now, he uses this for church planners um, well, that he, he mentors, and he because he, he wants to see their attitudes of their heart, and he can use it as kind of a powerful tool to see what their their heart really is after. And he says there's some interesting things, but it, he just blurted it out. He didn't mean it. He didn't purposely do that. It just came out. And he wrote, she didn't even pause for a second. She said, a beach house in Hawaii, a fancy cabin in the woods, and millions in the bank. And then she started to cry. She lo- She sobbed, and she said, that's an awful question to ask me. Why would you ask me that? And there was a fire in her eyes. He said, I apologize. I didn't mean to do it. It just kind of came out. But the agent was quiet for a time and she said, I'm so shallow. All I want is stuff, stuff that doesn't matter. It's just stuff. My life is wrapped up 
and, tough, and stuff. And she, he said she cried more. She said, you must think I'm awesome. My first thought wasn't even about my kids or my fiance or others at all. My first thoughts were all about superficial things that don't matter. It's the truth. I'm superficial, shallow. How can I change? I don't want to be like this. He responded, well, what do you think you need to do? She waited for a long time and she said, well, maybe I need God with more tears. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was phrased with that question and I saw that headline, to me, I have to admit that I'm more like that real estate agent than I'd care to do. I, I mean, my first inclination was I, I, I want Steph to be, to be done with the surgery, to be completely healed. I, I want the projects that I have done. It's so easy for us to think in the superficial, everyday kind of things, isn't it? Now, those aren't bad things necessarily, but if that is the only thing we care for, and if that's our initial response, it shows us that we too can be con- consumed with all these things that aren't necessarily bad things, but aren't the ultimate thing in our life, which should be our relationship with God. And how easy it is for us ourselves to kind of be as wayward as the Israelites. Now, we may not do complete evil, but our attention and our priorities and the things that dictate our life may not be as God as much as we want. And so the cycle of the story of Judges and the cycle that we find ourselves should always remind us of that. That our hearts as wayward and prone to wander, as one of the old hymns says, as the people of Judges. And even though we'd like to dismiss them, we'd look at the book and saying, well, it has nothing to do with us. In reality, it's a mirror in our hearts and it shows us how wayward we can be. But there's another lesson and that is that God uses all kinds of things to save his people. My daughter, Annika, and I, on, earlier this, this, uh, this week, were, I was putting her to bed, and, and she, we kind of were just sitting there talking, and she asked me, well, what are you preaching on today? And I told her the story of Ehud, and I got her to giggle because I talked a lot about farts and a lot more junior high language than I did for you guys here from the pulpit, okay? And, um, and it was a funny kind of a story, right? But then my daughter asked me this question because as she's processing through it, and she gave me permission to tell it, she says, well, dad, Ehud murdered the king and that bought delivery. Does that mean murder's okay? And I had to think about it. And I go, well, okay. I mean, no, the Bible says that murder isn't okay. And then I, I kind of went on this story about how, well, you know, murder is really like when you, you purposely kill somebody and that you have a kind of a, a, a sin in your heart and you're cold hearted and want to do that. There, it's different than accidentally killing somebody or in, in this sense, it's more like in self-protection or in self-defense. And, you know, we kind of ended it and it kind of went on. But there is that element to the book of Judges, isn't it? I mean, it's not a nice, easy t- book. I, I, it's not an easy book where there's easy answer. Her question raises up the difficult moral dilemma we face in the book of Judges. Well, they're sometimes funny and engaging stories uh, um, because they are stories of redemption and overcoming evil. And if there was movies made about this, we'd be sucked into the drama. But at the same time, things aren't always black and white. And we see that things aren't always, that, that sometimes there's difficult things that we have to wrestle with. And, and one of the wrestle of things that we have to wrestle with is that God actually does use Ehud and Shamgar's murderous actions to free the Israelites from their enemies. And so it forces us to kind of wrestle through this stuff. It forces us to wrestle through this. It's not so simple. But what we see here is that no matter how dark things may seem, and no matter how bleak they seem, that God is still at work in the midst of it. One commentator I read said, the narrator's silence on the role of God in the assassination of Eglon is deafening. His name is Daryl Block. And what he says is, if you compare him to Othniel, who's the judge before him, in Othniel, what was it that I taught over and over again? It's that the God was the primary subject of every sentence. I mean, look at the way God worked in it. The Spirit of the Lord came. The Spirit of the Lord did this. God did this. But if you look at the story of Ehud, God's there in the very beginning, and he's mentioned in the end, but there's a deafening silence in the middle. And and I think the narrator does it to say, hey, God used even these evil actions, these things that he condemns, 
to bring about the redemption that he brought, there's not quite the rubber stamp on their behavior like you would see in Nathaniel, where it was very much what he called him to do. And so we have to wrestle through these things. But one of the things that we see, but we should see that this is actually God's story of, of redemption throughout history. It's not just in the Old Testament. Matter of fact, if you look closely at the New Testament, what you'll see is that God used the wicked actions of the Romans and the Jews to lead to Christ's crucifixion to redeem believers. I mean, look at the book of Acts. Look at Acts 2. Look at Acts 4. Peter says some powerful things in a speech at Pentecost. He says, fellow Israelites, listen to me. The Jesus of Nazareth was the man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you as you yourself know. Now, if you look at all the miracles that Jesus did, these were all telltale signs because these were all things that those guys called the prophets predicted the Messiah should do. And so if anybody was paying attention, and if they were paying attention to what Jesus was doing, they would see that God was communicating to them that Jesus is the Messiah. But yet, this man was handed over by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge to you with the help of wicked men by putting him to death, by nailing him to the cross. And it was wickedness. The Jewish religious leaders felt threatened, and they used underhanded techniques. They lied. They falsely accused him. They used the, the cowardice of a pilot to stand up and a mob to bring across Christ's execution because he was a sinless man who didn't deserve it. But yet God used it to bring about the ultimate plan of redemption that you and I put their hope and trust in. Acts 4 verse 10 says this, then know this, you of all people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom is said, that this, whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus, the stone you, the builders, rejected, has become the cornerstone. Salvation and found in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven, heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. And this is when the religious leaders bring them in, give them a hard time for healing this person. But do you see that there's this tension that we don't necessarily like to wrestle with? How God can use even the evil of actions of others to bring about redemption. So in some ways it's unsettling. It raises that same question that, that my daughter raised to me. Where does this fit? How, how does all this tie together? On the same time, this should also bring about hope. Because our lives are messed up. Our lives are broken. I know many of the stories in this room, and you guys have faced evil done by very powerful things, terrible things. And the story of Judges and the story of Ehud and the story of Shamgar and all of these should also remind us that God's redemptive story is greater than the evil and the wickedness than the world around us. That God is still at work even when it feels like evil and wickedness is winning. And that God's redemptive story is at work in our lives, and it includes the messiness and the muck of our lives. Now, I'm a Stephen Colbert fan. Um, I, I didn't get Comedy Central when he was on that show, but I like, he's taken over the, the, um, the late show, which used to be David Letterman, um, on CBS. And this week I saw in an interview that he did with uh, uh, Anderson Cooper on CNN. Now, I haven't watched the whole interview, and um, so I, I don't know, but I saw the, the part that went viral where Anderson Cooper and him get in this deep conversation. Now, Colbert's a, uh, a comedian, but he is also an outspoken Catholic who will profess his faith in Christ. Now, he walks this fine line of holding on to his truth unapologetically, but yet uses humor to kind of diffuse things. And I, I actually really appreciate the kind of stance that he takes. Um, because he speaks the truth, but in a disarming way. And in this interview, Anderson Cooper asks him, I read in GQ magazine that you use this quote, what punishments of God are not gifts? And he says to Stephen Colbert, do you really believe this? Now, what you need to understand is Stephen Colbert's life has not been peachy keen. Like, after I read this quote, it kind of struck me, like, he talked about some really bad stuff that had happened to him and talked about it in vague terms about losing his dad. Turns out that when he was 10, his father and two of his 11 siblings died in a car crash. And he and Anderson, in this interview, actually, Colbert acknowledged the impact that this had on his mom, how he, that's probably one of the reasons why he ended up being a comedian, to try and make her laugh, and as an escape. So he's honest about the pain. 
But in trying to explain this and why he does this, one, he gives the quote to proper credit. He says, I just ripped it off from Tolkien. But when Anderson asks him, do you really believe this? He says this. He goes, if you're not grateful for your life, and not everybody is, and I'm not always, but it's the most positive thing to do, then you have to be grateful for all of it. You can't pick and choose what you're grateful for. In other words, what he's saying is, when you look at where your life, and you look at the spot where you're at, there's a story behind it. That story is made up of messed up things and good things. It's a combination of both. But he says, that is important. He, he says, they then go on to talk about suffering and how it's a powerful way we can connect with others and how it empowers us to love people even when they kind of come at us sideways sometimes because we understand that they too are going through pain and that suffering is this common bond. And he says, the gift of suffering is that it shows us the fullness of our humanity. And he said, I want to be grateful that, for that. That gratefulness includes that which I wished did not happen. What do you think about that? Here's a man who's gone through all kinds of tragedy, all kinds of difficult things in his life, and now is at a spot where he says, look, I don't want this to happen. If you were to ask me, do I want my father to die? No, I don't want my father to die. It was terrible. It was a horrible experience. But I also want to be grateful for the life that God has given me right here in this moment. And I have to admit that my life and everything up to this point is a mix of good and bad. And I want to, I can't just pick and choose what I'm grateful for. Either I'm grateful for it or I'm not. And then he says this, the great gift of the sacrifice of Christ is that God does it too. You're not really alone. God does it too. Now Anderson takes the conversation in a completely different way, but Stephen Colbert just preached the gospel. He said, look, God works in all of life. God works in all of it. And even though I would like to pick and choose, and even though if I had my choice, I'd erase all the hard things, God used all of it to bring me to the spot that I am today where I understand my brokenness, my sin, and the connection that I have to everyone around me. But the power of the gospel is that I'm not alone in that, that God God sent his son to live in the muck of human existence and lived a sinless life. And God used evil people to accomplish his goal, to be sacrificed and crucified on the cross, which is the most horrendous kind of execution you can face. But he did it because he had a purpose. And that purpose was to bring redemption to you and to I. For those of us who put our hope and trust in him, because Christ not only suffered physically on that cross, the Bible tells us that he suffered spiritually as well, that he suffered the wrath that you and I deserve for our sins. God used that terrible, terrible thing to bring about his redemption for you and I. And so when we're in the midst of all this muck, we need to remind ourselves that God works in the midst of it. And his grace works in it. That's the story of it. The Apostle Paul takes this a little bit different way in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 8 through 10, where he talks about this honest wrestling. And he says, look, I was given this thorn in my flesh. He calls it a messenger of Satan. Thorn in my flesh I can kind of handle. You know, I mean, I went and picked some blackberry bushes and got a couple of pricks. You know, they're painful, but he says they're a thorn that stays there. It's like a sliver that you can't get rid of, and it drives you nuts over and over again. But it's become infested, and it's there. And he said it's a thorn, a messenger of Satan. It was an affliction to him. And he says, I asked three times that it would be taken away, which just means he asked for him to, God to remove it three times, but even more than that. I asked God to remove it. And God responded, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is weakness. And when we're in those times where we wonder where God is at, when we're in those times when we feel the the effects of the wickedness of sin and the world around us, whether it be disease or the effects of that, where we feel so weak and we wonder where God is at work, the story of Judges reminds us that No matter how dark things may seem, 
that the sovereign God of the universe is still at work bringing about redemption. And the story of Judges tells us that God, Christ's grace is sufficient for you and I, that his power is made perfect in our weakness. Therefore, Paul says, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why for Christ's sake I delight in weakness and in insults and in hardships and persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. That's what Stephen Colbert is trying to say. I take it all, the good and the bad, because I've seen how God is at work, and I'm grateful for that. And so for those of you, us who put our hope and trust in Jesus, that's the beautiful message of the book of Judges. That's the beautiful message of a messed up story with junior high humor, like the story of Ehud, that God uses crazy and wacky things that you and I couldn't put together. I mean, let's be honest. It's like a junior high kid wrote this story. It's, but yet, God was at work in the midst of all of that. The book of Judges and the story of Ehud reminds us of this, that God's story of redemption can include the messiness and the muck of our lives and that his power is made perfect in our weakness even though we may not be able to see or feel it. Let's pray. You're listening to the Crossway Church in Battleground podcast. For more information about our church, check us out at crosswaychurchwa.com or join us at 311 North Parkway in Battleground, Washington, Sundays at 10 a.m.